Hello and welcome to the very first Red Team Energy Society video. As it looks like video are now the medium of communication, we decided here at the Red Team Energy Society that we would like to try to do it. All the more so that there are really a lot of topics we would like to present. And this is a challenge too, and a way to learn something, which is on top of it quite fun, and of course a new way to share with you. So here I am, I'm Dr. Hélène Lavoie, and I'm the director of the Red Team Analysis Society. What I intend to do is to develop a series on fundamental questions. I look at fundamentals which are addressed in our field, strategy for site warning and risk management, and also across the net in various media and settings. I really would like this series to be as useful as possible to everyone. I'll give you answers and explanations that are grounded in methodology, but also in social science, notably in my field, international relations and political science. I'll try to make it as fun and as entertaining as possible. If you like it, don't forget to give us a thumb up and I'll read all your comments, of course, so don't hesitate. So, today we are going to talk about political risk. What is political risk? This is a sentence that is very often used, notably by consultants and consultancy firms, but also in a lot of news articles. So, actually, what is it? First, let us look rapidly at what is risk. Risk is now defined by the International Standard Organization as the effect of uncertainty on objectives. I shall not enter into more details here, and you can read more about it on the website. For the time being, I would like to highlight that we have many different types of risk. Economic risk, social risk, ecological risk, and so on and so forth. And what interests us here, political risk. So, to sum up, political risk is the effect of uncertainty in a specific domain, politics, on our objectives. This leads us to our second question. What is this specific domain, politics? What does political risk address exactly. As I explained earlier, those who are mostly talking about and working with political risk are consultants and experts in political risk. For them, as well as often for their clients, political risk is everything related to regulations and laws and, in a lesser way, protectionist and trade-related policies. Then comes elections and governmental politics, as well as elite politics. A little bit also of social instability, but mainly if there are strikes, for example, or demonstrations. And sometimes they are also interested in possible disruption to supply chain and finally to the price of commodities and energy. Of course, the interest will depend upon the sector where you are working. But this is more or less what is addressed in general. The problem is that all this is actually the tip of the iceberg. And the tip is interesting, but it's only the tip. What interests us, in fact, is the whole of the iceberg, the whole of politics. Furthermore, if we really want to anticipate how the tip will evolve and change, thus overcome the uncertainty, then we need to understand the whole iceberg. We must be able to foresee what is happening there too. So, how can we handle the whole iceberg? This is what politics is really about. This is what we should really address when we talk about political risk. So, to understand what politics is about, it's easy. We only need to understand its fundamental dynamics. Once we get that, then we can make it more complex and adapt what we need to address the reality. So, let us imagine a simpler world sometime during prehistorical times. You have a group of men and women living at the time and they argue all the time. They are hungry, but they do not know what to do, when to start hunting. On top of that, they are afraid because someone has seen people they never saw before, and these people looked really frightening and raced after them, armed with maces. Gromok, one of the men of this group, convinced them to go and hunt along a specific trail, and they finally caught a prey. They cooked it, and ate it, and it was really delicious, and they stopped feeling hungry. So they started trusting him and listening to what he said. Meanwhile, when Grima tried to take the food of Kramak and refused to give it back, threatening Gromak, Gromak food back for Kramak and won. He then gave the food back to Kramak. So when Gromak suggested to go and sleep in a cave because it could be defended 
in case they were attacked by the frightening people, they all agreed. And they were right because a couple of nights later, suddenly they heard frightening shouts and saw many men with maces rushing toward them. But Gromok and the other hunters stood outside the caves and fought bravely, Gromok at their head. Quickly, the invaders left. Furthermore, compared with previous time when they had lost many of their goods during a raid, this time they lost nothing because the entrance of the cave was protected. Gromok had become their chief. Now, they listened to what he said in exchange for all his ideas and his efforts at implementing them with the others, the hunters were willing to share a part of their meat, while others were making clues for him. Indeed, they were all grateful for his leadership. This simple story just depicts the fundamentals of what is politics. The ruler, that is the chief, rules over people. His mission is to ensure the material security of the people. In our story, it was the food but you would even have the cave for the cold nights. He has to ensure domestic peace, that is no criminality, as with the story of Grima. Yes, I know, I borrowed the name from the Lord of the Ring. And finally, the ruler has to ensure protection from foreign enemies, that is, building defenses, such as with the cave, and fighting in our story. In exchange, the ruler receives resources that allow him to rule and legitimacy. With time, the ruler needs people to help him rule, his staff, and this staff is the basis for the state. This is the essence of what was explained by the great political scientist Max Weber and the no less great political sociologist Barrington Moore. Weber also explains that the ruler, actually the state for Weber, holds the legitimate monopoly of violence. That is, Gromok and those who help him are the only ones to be allowed to wield violence and they do so according to the rules and beliefs of what is now a tribe and not anymore a collection of individuals. Meanwhile, others in the tribe accept this use of violence. If you get this equation, then you can understand and follow all political situations. You get the essence of what is fundamentally politics. Of course, you will need to refine your understanding you will need to look at historical evolution. You will need to ask yourself hard questions to deal with what is happening now and what will happen in the future. For example, the way the ruler is chosen is what we call a regime. A regime can have very different characteristics according to the typology you choose. For instance, a regime can be a democracy that is ruled by the people, or an aristocracy ruled by an elite or a theocracy ruled by God, or rather, the people who represent God. And each type of regime can come under threat or display types of uncertainty and generate political risks. Whatever the type of supplementary knowledge you will need to have, at the heart, you have these simple and fundamental relationships we described in the little story of Gromok and his tribe. And again, once you understand that, you just need to build upon this understanding to have a more sophisticated knowledge adapted to time and space. So political risk is everything that can take place within the sphere of politics and create uncertainty or derail the interactions we saw. For example, it can be events that impact food security or legitimacy or the protection from foreign enemies. So as you see, when people looking at political risk only focus on elections, they only look at a very small part of what politics is. They only look at a way and only one way to choose a government in a democracy. But they completely ignore all the rest, all the other possibilities, how a polity that is a politically organized society came to be a democracy and so on and so forth. If there is no transition and uncertainty at work, that's fine. But how will they know? As they don't even try to monitor this possible transition, this is how surprises happen, and this is how the unfavorable effects of uncertainty on objectives can hit very negatively any actor. On the contrary, if you look at the essence of what politics is in terms of interactions, as we did, then you will have understood the gist of what politics is about. And by doing so, you will have the building stones upon which you can build your model to anticipate and foresee the future.
you will be able to identify all uncertainties and you will be able to monitor everything that truly matters and you will also be able to identify these very famous weak signals. So check our articles at the Red Team Analysis Society on our website as they will go, of course, much further into what is political risk. You will also be able to learn much more in terms of methodology to anticipate this risk. And finally, you will be able to read more about very specific political risks. We also developed online courses so that you can train to anticipate and foresee these very issues. That's it for this first video explaining what is political risk. I hope you liked it. See you soon for another video on another fundamental question.